Hello, and welcome to the Practical Creative Podcast, where I talk to people who are out there actively making and doing creative work. I want to know more about their materials, their processes, what it is that motivates or inspires them to keep creating. And along the way, I'm also learning more about the nature of creativity itself. I'm Jeremiah Craigie, and in this episode, I'll be talking with glass artist Matt Duran. I found this conversation to be genuinely exciting and inspiring because of how Matt has constructed his career. So many of the people I speak with who are working creatively feel that they aren't appreciated for their skills and knowledge, for all those hours that they've spent practicing and developing their understanding of process and materials. But Matt flips all of that on its head. By collaborating with sectors outside of the arts or craft, he has found an audience who value his skills and expertise, not just practically, but financially as well. In this episode, we talk about the numerous benefits of working outside of the crafts or arts environment, including how it challenges him to learn more about his materials and processes, how it helps to reframe his own understanding of the value of his knowledge, and how all of that feeds back into his studio practice. We also get into possible avenues to making connections within industry where craft skills are needed and valued, the challenges of finding a common vocabulary when collaborating outside of the creative sector, and the benefits of maintaining multiple strands in your practice. Matt's approach is as refreshing as it is inspiring and offers a completely different take on a career in craft. So please enjoy this episode of The Practical Creative. My name is Matt Doran. I'm an artist, curator, uh, innovator, and I have many strands to my London studio practice. I predominantly work in the material of glass. That's what I was trained to do. That's what my experiences have been over the years. And there's a lot of uh, technology and techniques that goes into glass making and uh, a little bit of uh, algorithm. It's led me on a sort of merry dance through through various different uh, applications to glass. If you walk through a city, if you start to look at it with glass eyes, you you see so, so much glass. So many different types of glass, so many different approaches to glass. Glass is really around us. And because of this, because I'm not a one approach to glass artist, I sort of have to learn a lot about the material and about the approaches to glass. And because of that, having that skill set, it's transferred into other industries. And that's kind of basically what's happened to my practice, is that it divides in three different types of practice over the year. So I do artwork. I do uh, research and also I curate events around glass. Fantastic. Yeah, so <laughs> that's a brilliant introduction because there's loads in there to, that uh, I, I, I'd like to explore. And I, the first one is, is why glass? Like, w- what is it that attracted you to it or brought, you, brought that to your attention as a medium? Okay, so basically I had, uh, as, as most people do, uh, when I left school, I um, flirted with all sorts of different types of things that I might do with my life. And one of them was, initially, was to be a chef. I trained to be a chef, and, and I was very interested in, in, in recipes and putting things together. I had three sisters, and they were married to three chefs. So you can imagine what Christmas was like around the Christmas table. And so that, so that was my initial introduction to the working life. And what I, what I did was to play and was the ice carving. Sorry, I, I, I lost a little bit of that. You said what, what you enjoyed was the... Was the ice carving, the display. And I actually, when I initially first moved to London, I, I, did, I worked for an ice carving company. Um, at the same time, uh, I was interested in doing restoration on furniture. And uh, I was a little bit of a, a sort of skip merchant. I used to go in and, and find old bits of furniture. And you should do stew them up and sell them at Camden Camden Lot Market. And um, one day I came across a Victorian gl- uh, stained glass panel that had come out of a house in Hampstead, and it was so big that it had been folded in half to get into the container. And um, I took it out and I took it back to where 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 I was uh, living and working. And I just thought it was really I thought it was just such a shame. I thought it was really uh, I thought it was really like, it felt like vandalism to me. And I started to join an evening class to see if I could just repair it and, and make it good again. And the first session of learning about glass, I just was, this is for me. I just absolutely 
it was a light bulb moment. And um, so I, 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 I got into stained glass, got into restoration of stained glass. <clears throat> and then I started to make very three-dimensional stained glass. And someone said to me, you know, maybe you should just do glass sculpture. And that, again, was another moment. And uh, that took me on a journey to studying uh, here in the UK and in Scandinavia. And uh, yeah, that, that was my journey. That started my journey. Wow. Okay. <laughs> I think we have a, uh, yeah, I can relate to your, your interest in skips and found materials in that, in that sense. But what, uh, it's, it's amazing that it's led, it's taking you so far. Uh, th yeah. <laughs> I find that quite exciting. So, um, you, you also refer to yourself then as an innovator. What, what do you mean by that? Well, because, because, uh, there's a lot of technology and material technology that goes into, uh, working with glass. And it was at a time when I was at university that when I was studying, um, glass and ceramics, 3D design, that, um, we were introduced to the labs and we did, uh, glass technology as part of the course. And I realized that there was quite a serious science part to producing glass and, and uh, the science teacher was, was, say, showing us um, lots of possibilities with glass, which people weren't really en engaging in an artistic way. And I just thought that was really interesting that there was this, there was this, this discipline in glass making, but there was a sort of beauty, a beauty in that uh, discipline. And even in the sort of documentation, the way that you fire a kiln, um, the, the way that the glass responds to heat, uh, I just found all these things really interesting, and I just just felt that um, that the glass has got so much. It transcends into so many different industries and so many different disciplines, whether it's medical, science. Uh, that all these areas have uh, have a use for glass and have a need for glass, um, and uh, and I felt that my skill set could really contribute towards those areas, and that took me on a on a, on a different path, of course. Yeah, I'm curious to know quite how you you've navigated your the, the range of, of things that you uh, of, of uh, context that you work in because I, I've written down I was, I was looking at some of your work and I, and I wrote down a question for you which was why not just develop a line of products to sell either functional or or sculptural because some of the things that you've made look highly commercial as they could be beautiful, um, uh, maybe slightly more sculptural uh, paperweights, or they could be transformed into dishes. But that's clearly not a, a direction, as, as far as I'm aware, that you've gone down. Uh, and I'm curious to know why not? What's what's kept you out of that 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 more traditional craft person approach to to working with the material? Well, probably the simple answer to that is itchy feet, I should imagine, but. Uh... No, I, I've never really gone down that way because I've seen people go down that way and that's fine for them. Um, they, they see that if they have a very tight uh, parameter of their, in their practice, they can expand a lot within that tight parameter. I, I've always just really been fascinated with, um, the, the, the element of being fully in control or doing my artwork. And yet part of my practice is about teamwork and working with other people and not only in the glass area, but also um, then sending into other areas. I like that dialogue. I like to be pushed with the material and I, and people will come to the studio and say to me, is it possible to, to work with glass this way? And I go, well, to be honest with you, I don't know. Which should we ever go? Should we try it? And I, I kind of like that kind of honesty because I think a lot of times people will put across that, um, that they can do something when they can't, or 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 they they price things in such a way that they know that they won't get the job. I I actually like to be upfront and honest with the client and say, why don't we do a journey together? Why don't we do a journey of discovery and see if it's possible? And actually, what's interesting about it is sometimes they push me in a push me into an area that I don't I didn't fully realise it was possible, and I like that being challenged in that way. Um, <clears throat> I've I I can blow glass. But when I look at the glass I make, they're all one off. If you ask me to make 30 of the same wine glass, I couldn't do that. My skill set's not there. I don't have that skill set. But if you want 30 individual handmade <laughs> wine glasses, I can do that for you. Um, 
no, I just, I don't, I don't really like to repeat myself. Uh, I never have. I, I like, I like to, to, to try things out and push the material that can. And that's, that's, that's what keeps my interest. That's what keeps me going in my practice is that is, is the new. Mm. And I'm curious to know, do you differentiate between the new being uh, a new process or technique or application versus a new almost conceptual idea that takes you down a different path? I think I've always been driven by the idea. And then don't get too wrapped up in the technique. Don't get too wrapped up in a particular type of glass to work with. Work with the idea first and then adapt a technique or adapt the glass to that idea. I'm very much ideas driven. And actually now over the years, I don't necessarily have to make the piece. I can actually visualize what that piece is going to look like and make a, make a, a decision whether I go forward or not. Uh, and that's, that's what happens with the experience that you can do that. But I don't need to waste lots of glass or lots of energy to produce something that I know what the outcome will be. So I'm, I'm much more discerning these days about exactly what I make and how I make it, and how I approach it. There are lots of unknowns in glass and, uh, the trick is to try and take out as many unknowns as possible to achieve what you want to achieve. That, that surprises me because it sounds like so much of what you've you do is so experimental mm-hmm. uh, and it's those experiments the result of those experiments that that leads to new new ideas and innovations that you are learning in the process so by anticipating what the outcome it would be and and then making a decision on not going down particular routes because you know what it'll look like um, doesn't that shortcut your process no, what, what, what you do is you, you want to do your experimentation on other people's time and money. And so basically. <laughs> Wait, I got to write that down. That's a brilliant business tip. <laughs> okay. So what you do, basically, I get asked to do a lot of research into mold, new molding systems, new types of glass, and I get paid well to do that. Um, and so what I would do, of course, is, uh, there's always a bit of space in the kiln. For me to be experimented to do some experimentation with uh, their new products and their new molding systems for, for my own personal research, um, I'm really happy to do all the experimentation and, and you know, happy accidents are quite key to these things. But as far as uh, exhibiting my my work, I, I I do want there to be an idea behind that piece before I before I start to create it. Um, a lot of times the exhibitions are themed or there's a title or, or, or it's part of a body of work. So I feel like the idea just needs to come first and, and then, hey, let's just play around with that and see how it looks. And um, there's, there's many different ways that you can uh, you can approach, approach the glass and approach the material. Um, but I think it's really good to have a strong idea at the start of it. OK, so I'm curious to know how you then assess the results of an experiment, because if you're following an idea, and you don't necessarily know what the the final product, the outcome will be. How do you measure or qualify the what you've created? Is it how true it is to the idea? Is it how well it expresses the process? Or is there an aesthetic judgment that comes into play? How do you value or judge what comes out at the end of that that process of exploration? I think I think it's really like a, a multitude of all those things you just said, actually, and I think it gets it all gets sort of blended in into one, into one thing. But but I, I, I mean, sometimes the idea comes by accident. Um, like um, when I work with photograms, that, that's that's placing my glass onto a photographic p- piece of paper in a dark room and exposing light through it, and then you see the internal workings of the glass. Now. That that's you could say that's a technique, but I also saw a quality in, in it, and that I can also manipulate the glass to to produce that quality and that form. But the where they came from was the fact that I was making glass in other countries and coming through customs with my 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 glass in my luggage and seeing my um, luggage being X-rayed in an X-ray machine at the airport and seeing my glass in a completely different way, in a new one for me and. Then coming back and talking to photographers, and they say that's really easy. You can capture that if that's what you want. You can capture that. So you could say, what came first, the idea, or or, or what was the inspiration, or what was the technique? Um, it, it all blends itself in. In and at the end of the day, I then have to represent that on the paper as 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 my idea. 
So it's almost like create the work, forget about the technique, because it's the, the actual visual visual end product is the important thing for me. I'm not sure that answers the question, but it's almost like learn or, learn all the techniques and then forget about all the techniques to make the artwork. It's very easy to be seduced by the material and the glass to 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 um, to produce something that's very technically uh, well made, and everyone goes, "Oh, that's a, that's a really fantastic piece of artwork because it's technically really good." And it's not really what floats my boat. What floats my boat is the idea, and then I can then incorporate the technique to make that idea successful. I'm still curious to know then, like for example, with the photograms, at some point there has to be uh, there have to be decisions made about which ones you keep, uh, which ones you don't, which pieces of glass you put on the paper, uh, perhaps even the angle or the the orientation of the glass on the paper, uh, which is sort of transcends the idea, and then the, and that becomes more about uh, aesthetics. And I'm curious to know how you uh, well how, how how you go through that process as well. Okay, so basically what you do is, um, uh, the, the, well, this is the magic printing because you don't really know what the image is going to look like until you print it onto the paper. So what mm-hmm. we, we can do is within a day, I can do 200 images through a, through a color darkroom. And then I will go through those images, uh, once the paper has been processed and dried, uh, and do my selection. And I might select 10 images from that 200 that I produced. Um, because it is essentially what I'm, what I'm thinking is going to be. Um, it's a really curious thing, but I have to make the glass really badly to be the glass that's used as a negative on the glass. And the reason why I have to do that is because I put, can put stress, cords, bubbles into the glass, and that's what gives this beautiful effect on the photographic paper. If I made it absolutely perfect, optically perfect, I would just have a form without any texture. Uh, the interesting thing about it was that about that process was I made a load of pieces in red glass, and then and then discovered that uh, none of it worked on the paper, because of course in a dark room red is a safe light. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's some there's like pursuing an idea, and then the technique reined me back in again, went back in again. <laughs> that yeah, that, but then that potentially opens up new potential to create almost voids in the form if Absolutely. you create spaces with red glass that you know won't be that, that won't read on the paper yeah it's it's a little bit like um developing a whole library of work so that you then have an understanding of of how this works i call it my like dorian gray glass it's the glass that never goes on display because it's so badly made but through the photo photo photogram process that's the art piece. That's the finished piece, and that's and that's the piece that looks wonderful on the paper. Um, but I have got this the bank of glass that no one no one sees because they're very poorly made. There's lots of problems with the glass. It's actually probably not even safe because it's got so much stress going through it. Okay, so that that leads me to a, a slightly different um, practical question, which is what. Yeah, I guess it's twofold. What do you do for storage when you're collecting and making? large amounts of physical objects which lots of craftspeople have the uh, uh have that challenge and also what does your your studio space look like and and is the storage part of it or is it separate well it's a very curious thing we uh, we uh, my partner she is a ceramicist um and when we 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 both realized that we were uh needing a bigger studio and also our studios we're about uh, an hour and a half away from where we lived. So we were becoming commuters as well and spending a lot of time on the road. So we decided that our ultimate aim was to have a live-work situation. So we discovered a, a building in East London in the year 2000. And um, that building allowed us to um, have studios, uh, live above the studios, build a roof garden, um and but one of the, the things that really attracted us to the building was uh, a huge cellar, and and that was a real s- swinger for us on this on 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 purchasing the building because there's, there's fantastic storage here. Um, but I'm also I'm also uh, wary of um, of uh, reusing glass when I can, uh, and if I make a finished object, um, you know, obviously. Um, Work gets bought, or work goes uh, on permanent display, or it becomes part of a collection. 
Um, and so, so yes, it's it's something to. to I, I, I like to keep an eye on all the glass I have because I don't. I, I think when when work goes in boxes and gets stored away, it can be out out of your mind. And uh, but I'm very conscious of that. Yeah, I try. To, I try to always keep on top of, of that um, because I see them as a sort of library of and, and a cloud resource that I can just tap into. So I have very open shelving. And uh, all my glasses on display, so I know uh, where everything is at any moment. Does that pose a cleaning problem? Well, um, glass is pretty easy to clean, to be honest, um, and it's pretty easy to store. Uh, you can store it in, in damp damp cellars, that's for sure. <laughs> and, uh, okay. There's a kind of way of, of, of cleaning glass, um, and sometimes I have to be quite brutal and 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 and, and get rid of glass. Uh, recycle it for sure. Um, also, um, I've donated quite a lot of glass to glass courses and glass colleges because um, I think that uh, that can be a block towards uh, towards people making work. Uh, it's because the material costs are high. Um, so uh, yeah, we do that. Um, I also I organise an event called the Glassy Challenge. Mm-hmm. And that came about because I I had two two worlds collided. I was working with uh, waste management companies on various projects, working with architects about the recycling and upcycling of glass. And also, uh, I was curating a lot of exhibitions for, for glass artists. So I had a lot of colleagues who were, who were glass artists. And what I found was um, in the waste management uh, sector, um, they had a lot of waste glass. Uh, waste glass is about 15 pounds a ton. It's it, it, it's so low valued. We've seen a problem that seemed to be hard to find solutions for. And then I had another community of glass artists that were that were struggling to find ways of supporting themselves in their practice. And uh, I felt that if we could bring those two groups of people together and turn what is perceived as a waste material into a high value product, then um, then we're not then we're starting to see recycled glass as a resource rather than a waste material. And I just really wanted to open up and an, an, I, I I didn't go there with I uh, hey I have all the answers. I just wanted to set a space for people to have a discuss discussion to say can we find solutions to this? Because there's so many different types of glass out there. They all have their uniqueness, but they also have their own unique problems about disposal of. Um, so I, I really, I really felt that as a citizen of the world, I really felt like I, I felt that I could have an input. Um, we set up one event uh, around 2004, and we've just done events all over the world with this about bringing these sort of communities of people together and problem solving and. Um, and linking in with museums and industry and uh, and, and waste management companies and um, yeah, it's it's been really interesting and and it's quite joyous because of because people love to show, show what their skills are and people love to try and solve problems. So it's a good combination. Yeah, it, it sounds fantastic, and particularly the fact that it's a, a material that. Can, can be reused so many times. Is there a limit to how how reusable glass is? Um, well, I, I mean, the, the thing about it is if you keep reheating glass, you do slightly di- diminish its possibilities. Also, uh, a lot of glass that's produced um, is called a lot of everyday glass. So you your bottle glass. It's, high, it's highly produced, uh, high volume. Uh, the materials are quite low, low, low quality. Um, in the industry, it's called pig glass because it's it's got so many different impurities in it, and the problem with it is that if you keep reheating and reheating, those those impurities get more and more in with it comes to the surface of the glass, and the quality of the glass goes down. So, really, what you're trying to look for is uh, uh, quick solutions to to uh, to the glass, and, so, and sometimes it doesn't necessarily have to be a hot process; it could be a cold process. So, so that could be cutting and grinding and polishing, and you, you can you, there's lots of ways that you can reuse reuse glass, but it just really depends on what glass it is and um, and and how you can move that forward as a, to making the products. So, 
you're you're creating these events and you're you also mentioned collaboration. Could you talk a little bit about some of the collaborations that you've done? Well, well, as far as the Glassy Towns is concerned, we we um, uh, the last event that we did uh, was co- was called uh, Rethinking Beer Drinking. We, that was a, a, um, a glass museum in Denmark and a local brewery uh, coming on board for the project, and they host a lot of events at the brewery, and they just wanted us to. They gave us glass, their waste glass. And we made products for them, and um, to to and, and invited artists to come and to be part of a week week longer set of events. And then at the end of it, we we displayed one of the openings of the brewery. And an example of that was one of the artists um, came up with the beard glass. This is a glass that is hands free that you strap to your face. And that you're able to can continually drink whilst doing other activities like phone, your mobile phone, and etc. And it was just a fun, it's a fun event, but also it has a serious element to it as well because it, it demonstrates to people that that you can recycle glass and the glass can have a secondary life, and that um, and that uh, the, the, rather than the processing of trying to get rid of glass. So, so a really good example of that is uh, if you think about the bottle. Uh, they get the raw materials out the ground, and then they have to melt those raw materials together to make a bottle. The bottle then has to be transported to a, a place where they will put the liquid into the bottle. The bottle is then uh, delivered to the delivered to the place where it's brought to the scene. And then that bottle, so that's a lot of energy and a lot of time to get that bottle to that point. Once the liquid is taken out of the bottle, the bottle becomes a waste material. We are spending more time trying to dispose of that bottle than we are actually creating it in the first place. And that's, that's, that's the, 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 the issue that we have now is the fact that, um, so that bottle, uh, if you follow that journey, it gets transported, uh, made into a big heap of glass, then transported overseas to a crushing machine. It gets crushed into a certain size. Then that's transported back to us. So that we can then use it as hardcore for roads. And, and it just seems absolutely crazy to me that we are in a situation where we're spending more time and energy trying to dispose of a bottle than actually make it in the first place. So, uh, and those, those are the issues that we have to, that are around us now. And that's why I feel that people who work with glass have the skill sets and understanding of what they can do to, uh, and maybe even possibly come up with some answers for that. That's the way I'm coming from the glassy tangent. As far as my other collaborations go, it's normally out of a conversation or people know that they can, that I work in a certain way, um, so that I, um, I'm, I'm quite experimental with what, with my practice. So I work with a number of companies and whenever they get a, a, a line of inquiry that's not really in the remit of their making, they tend to send them to me and I will do the experimentation to try and find solutions for that. So, so that would run into medical projects, medical research, molding system uh, companies. Um, yeah, the whole, a whole remit of, uh, of uh, exploration within that. And when you're when you're collaborating outside of the, the 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 glass sector or people who understand glass the way that you do, for example, if it's a a medical company, how do you go about? finding a, a common vocabulary for talking about sort of marrying their needs with your understanding of the material? That is such a great question because that is something that we're having to try and deal with all the time because language between these different disciplines is really incredibly difficult. And uh, and I would quite often ask them to uh, say, say to them, well, could you just do me a quick drawing? And they they almost refuse to do that because they feel they're not good drawers. I'm always asking them for a, a, a visual explanation of what they want, and they're always trying to tell me a little version of it. And um, it is difficult to come up with that common language, but it just takes a bit of time and patience, unfortunately. And I, but I would love to be part of something that would develop a better understanding between these disparate groups, because language is so key. Um, the, the reason why I get approached so much is because um, technology is moving so fast. Um, it used to be that, say, if you were doing medical research, you would go to a scientific glass company 
you would go to the shelf, you say, I'd like a couple of those, and they'd lift them off the shelf, and uh, you purchase them, and you go back and do, you start carry on doing your research. Then it started developing where they would go to, go to come and say, well, I don't really want what's on the shelf. I just need a little bit of something different. Uh, can you do this, this, and this? And those med- and those 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 uh, glass makers who who were, came out of the tradition of glass making would go, yeah, uh, I can probably do that. And they would play around with it, and they would come up with pretty roughly what they, what they needed. Technology is moving so quickly now that actually what you'll find is they'll come to you and say, we don't quite know what we want. Uh, it's got to sort of do this, it's sort of kind of got to do that. And the, the, me- and the, and the maker is now having to use a lot of imagination, creative leaps, innovation, to come up with the solutions for the glass that they need for their research. And that's why it's trans- transcended out of the reams of just technicians into the more artist-maker realm. And, 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 and actually, when you show, uh, the medical research teams what's available now and what's, what, what's happening in digital craft, what's happening with the new materials that are coming on board. And there's even more materials coming on board every year. They start to see that that can affect their research because they go, Oh, you, is that possible? Or if that's possible, well, we've had this idea for ages. Um, and, and you start a dialogue like that, but you have to kind of basically be able to communicate what you, what you can do. And they've got to basically communicate what they need. And if you can find that common area, it really expands really quickly. And then you become quite embedded into their project. So my example of that has always been that, um, that uh, it's a little bit like research, especially medical research. It's a bit like trying to, to build a building and running a high-performance car. And then what what if they use lots of components and they all have to work absolutely brilliantly together and um and they're highly engineered, highly thought out, highly high quality material. What's ha- what happens is uh in part of that research process they will get a PhD medical student to make something or commission something to be made. And that student's probably not touched material or cross since an early age. And yet they're expected to come up with something that's, that's really high level. And what they do is they, 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 they don't really have that capacity because they have been doing, working on theory. They've been doing theory all their lives and they're not got any sort of practical sense or pr- understand process, materials, uh, mm. even the dexterity of their hands to come up with something. So, th- so, so they, they sort of, they don't do a bad job, but the, the element they come up with is, would be a bit like doing the high performance car. But taking one element and going to a local school and asking them to do it. They'll do it fantastic to their ability, but it won't be at the same standards as all the other parts of the elements of the research or this high performance car. They put that into the car. The car doesn't work or it doesn't work that well. So what they then do is they then analyze every single component on that car to find out what the problem is. And as an artist maker who understands the process and materials, I'm into the lab and see within a day I can see where the problem is because they're not educated in that they're looking at, looking at the problem I am and and, and what, what, sorry to interrupt what, what do you think your your way of looking at it how do you feel that your way of looking at it is different because I understand because I understand the process of making things I understand about the material and what's possible with the material I understand what materials are coming on online t- that you're able to purchase I understand the uh, modern techniques, uh, the sort of digital craft revolution that we've gone through. I understand all those elements. Um, they're not expected to know that. They, they understand about the medical research side of it. And that's, so if you're getting funded like seven to eight million pounds for your research project, and ultimately what you're making at the end of it is a bispoke object, you not think it'd be a good idea to have somebody who understands about making bispoke one-off objects on that team? Mm. I think it's small, small bit, of small, small, a small price to pay to have someone with that expertise on the on, 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 uh, involved in that uh, research project. And I think it's there. Suddenly, researchers and, and medical research teams are starting to realise the value of having like that on the team. And I think uh, that's great for my community because we need opportunities outside our practice to sustain our practices. So it's a win-win as far as. I'm 
Okay, so, so that leads me to two, two, two questions. One is, if I were to give you a group of craftspeople who are very knowledgeable about their particular materials, but they're interested in doing something similar, collaborating in completely different sectors, what advice would you give them in, to help them negotiate that, uh, those interactions? Well, well, this this is really like a plank, a major plank to what I'm trying to achieve now, as far as my involvement with various organisations, because I think that it's becoming more and more apparent that there should be much, much stronger ties between uh, the artist, maker, craftsperson, and and uh, the research and the research that's going on in this country. Um, so, and I think actually it will become more and more prevalent. But we need really good examples of it. It's your, in a in a sense. You're uh, trying to change a culture that's been like that for hundreds of years, and you've got to try and ch- change that. But I think we just need really, really good examples of that. If if I was somebody who um, who was starting out, who had an interest in that, uh, and uh, and would want to be involved, I think that what you need to do is you need to to uh, try to develop your skill set so that you have something to offer as far as that research goes, and then it's a case of trying to get some dialogue going. But there's certainly there's some organisations that are looking into the way or trying to link that much more, um, like some sort of parallel pra- practice type type event where you, that, and and I think hospitals are now much more university hospitals are much more interested in having artists of residency artists of residence that's not only about the artists coming in and doing uh, uh, you know. Uh, I've always said that, that, that there's always a danger of the artist of residency in, in places where they, the, the, the artist has a great time, the scientist gets some nice photographs for the lab. You know, it needs to be a much stronger, deeper uh, connection that's made, uh, much more transferable of the skill sets, a much deeper uh, collaboration. All we can do is set good examples of what can happen when you do that. And if you do that, then, then people become, you start to change the culture around that. But we're a long way off. But I think that we, but it, it, the trend is going that way, and I think it will become more and more apparent. Um, we'll get better, better examples of it, and and then people. And I, I actually think, on a government level, when they come to fund medical research, they'll they'll look at that much more strongly and say, look, why aren't you using local skills? Why aren't you? You know, I think it will become. Uh, it, it's it, like I said, it's a change of the culture, and the, the culture is changing. So I think. Uh, more more possibilities will open up. Yeah, and, and a slight extension of that is, would you have any top tips for developing a vocabulary or helping bridge the knowledge gap or the understanding between someone who's who knows a material versus someone who has a a need? Well, I think I think I think it's I think you've got to do do exhibitions. I think you need to do exhibitions, and you need to try to invite those 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 the, the, the people that you're interested in working with to those exhibitions and, and get a dialogue going. You've also got to try and understand what they're what they're trying to do with their research. Um, I don't think there's a panacea for that. There's not a step by step guide to how you do that. It's about about developing about developing a, a, a contact and a relationship. A lot of these places, they, a lot of these places, they are, um, really looking, um, it's, is they're looking to make a contact with, um, you know, a lot of times they're doing making, and, and I think that it's, it's a, a little step, but, but it's, it's almost like, this is what I have to offer with that, with that connect with what your research you're doing, and you have to, I think in a sense, you have to sort of, you know, you have to start with making that contact, and so you have to start with um, just making that connection. And sh- it's almost like you have to maybe give a kind of some free uh, samples to them and say, "Look, this is what's possible." So, but it, it just really depends on what the research is and which area that you're looking at, um, because some places just don't realise that they have that connection. Like, I have a colleague called Shelley James, and she has a way of putting uh, structured bubbles within optical glass. She was able to link in the mathematical department at Bristol University, and she was able to put their mathematical formulas within the glass, and because of the refractory quality of the glass, they were able to see see their their mathematical work in the physical. Wow. 
And then they suddenly realized that they wanted a deeper collaboration with it because they could see the benefits. So you've got to start off small, but if it times with what they're doing with their research, then you can develop that, 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 uh, that contact. The problem we have slightly is there's no protocol or, or wage structure, if you like, for that collaboration at the moment. And that's what I think is the next uh, step is that so that the researchers know where they stand, the artists makers know where they stand, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a well trodden path and a protocol for how that, how that relationship can develop. Um, especially when it comes to intellectual property and all those different areas. Um, it's just so new that we, there's nothing really there in our yet. And, um, but that's what we're trying to work on. That's what, um, I, I want my community to be treated as professionals. Um, I have a fear sometimes that artists are very generous and, um, they don't, aren't always offered an artist fee for the things that they do. Uh, they're expected to do things for free and there's not many professions out there that are expected to do things for free. So for me, I think this is what we need to develop further because I think we need, should be treated as professionals because that's what we are. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very exciting actually that there's, um, well, well the, the model that you, you've created is, is very exciting because it is opening up a, an entirely different pathway, which I think isn't, certainly isn't in the first the, the immediate thoughts that come to mind when someone thinks about uh, pursuing a career in craft. So yeah, it's very exciting to see to see where that can go, and that's clearly been very successful for you on on a whole number of levels. It reminds me of um, uh, I, I interviewed Keith Brimmer Jones, who's a he's a ceramicist, and he runs a company that licenses other artists' work, and then he he translates it into ceramic objects. Uh, to, it sort of, so it extends the brand that other artists are have created into different media. But what he gets from r running a business that's much more about a, a commodity is that he's constantly having to, in the same way that you've, you've mentioned with your collaborations, having to learn new techniques and being exposed to different uh, ways of producing materials or di even different materials. And that all feeds back into his artistic practice and, and his studio practice, because now he has a wider range of almost ingredients to play with or, or processes to explore. So it, it's not uh, detrimental to his practice. It's actually, an, it, it expands and challenges his work, which is exactly what is an exact parallel to the things that you're saying. And I think that's really exciting for for people who are interested in developing their understanding of a material that there there are ways of of almost structuring that externally by collaborating with other people no absolutely i totally agree with that i mean i i would say that the, the, the key the, the most important thing to it about it as well is the fact that um because it's very easy to get seduced by doing collaborations and being paid by collaboration and paid through doing the collaborations but not to the detriment of your own creative artistic practice because without that you're you're not going to be contributing in the collaborations as much as you should be, so it, it is a balancing act. But but mm. you can see how because I know lots of people who are artists that have to do other things to make a living, and they don't then they stop doing their art, and then they get very frustrated by the fact they're not doing their art anymore because they're caught up with trying to make money to keep their studios going, but they're stu but they're not able to get in the studios to make the work. I've seen that happen so many times over the years, and I think it's such a waste of all that skills that they've taken to get to that point. And I just think they're, 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 you know, my father said to me once, he said, do you know what the best job in the world is? And I, uh, this is when I was about 15. And I said, no, I don't know. What is the best job in the world? He said, the best job in the world is the one, the one that every day is different. And, and, mm. and, and I have, that is my mantra. I want my days, all my days to be different. I don't want to do the same job every day. I want to do different jobs. And I think that if you have a broad practice, it allows you to be successful in each element of that 20% of the year, you're going to have a busy year. <laughs> because if you've got five strands, and each of those strands only it keeps you busy 20% of the year, that's 100% busy, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. But but yes, it, but it's that thing of... of it, it just comes up time and time again in conversations about creativity is the juxtaposition 
of two or three different elements that don't necessarily immediately have a, a connection. And it's in finding that connection or how they bump up against each other that new ideas emerge. So it just makes sense that the more strands you have, the more diverse strands you have in your, your practice or your life, the more likely those, those uh, crossovers or, 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 or sparks of inspiration are likely to occur. This, absolutely, there's nothing better than being 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 in in, in, a, in a meeting where you're the expert of your field, and you're surrounded by people who are experts in their field, and and you're the trusted voice in your specific field. And there's nothing better because because then you can really expand their their knowledge and their thinking, and they're, as they're expanding your, your you know your knowledge and your understanding of what they do. There's nothing better. Um, and you know, you know, I think it's very easy to get caught up in your own community and your and and, uh, and not outreach. Um, it's very easy to be uh, feeling that you're in control of your practice by working by yourself and not connect, not connecting with the world around you. Um, it, it is, like I say, we get back to the same thing. It's it's a balance. It's a live 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 work balance. It's a it's a it's all those things that you need. Um, I used to be a completely obsessive. A worker, and then uh, to and not think of anything else but glass. And then I quickly realised that actually I wasn't having eureka moments because I was so caught up in trying to learn the material and being spending time in the studio. Uh, and and a colleague of mine said, you know, sometimes you just need to go to the cinema or theatre and you'll just see something that will be your which will which will push you into all sorts of uh, areas of your work uh, and expand your ideas. And uh, and that's that's true. You need some time out. To then refocus when you go back to what you did. So um, mm. I, I don't feel like I need to make every day because because I'm but in, in my mind I'm processing um, all the time. You know you can't help yourself. Um, and and I've and I've often thought I've often had ideas that are not glass related for artwork, but it's amazing when you go on that journey that it en ends up being a glass a glass piece and. Um, I've got a really good example of that, actually. Um, in in around 2000, um, I was having quite a difficult time. I had some difficult clients. I was making glass that wasn't really working. Um, I wasn't really happy with the work that I was producing for my own art practice. And um, and I got uh, and it was raining. It was raining. It was raining. Yes. <laughs> and uh, I really felt like. I don't want to do glass anymore and I don't want to be in the studio anymore. Uh, I, I, I think I need to do something else. And at that moment, uh, the phone rang and it was a friend of mine who's a, a colleague of mine who's, who's based out in Ireland and he's a photographer, but he also does archaeological digs. And he rang me and said, how's it going? And I said, well, it's going awful, really bad. Uh, and I think I might just throw the whole thing in. And he said, well, that's funny because I'm ringing you to see if you want to come out to Ireland for six weeks. Because we need people to do an archaeological dig. Uh, it's a Neolithical site. It's about six thousand years old. And uh, and uh, I said, yeah, that's great. I'd love to do that. When do you want me to come? He said, well, can you come here tomorrow? And I went, yeah, I can. So I found myself going to Ireland. I found myself uh, traveling to the south of Ireland, the Wicklow Mountains, uh, and on the Wicklow Gap, there was this archaeological site. It was about five and a half thousand years old. Um, near the lithical site and I was standing in Waterfruce in the rainy Irish countryside um, and, and they gave me a spot on the archaeological site and um, it was a slot trench so this is like a wall of a uh, foundations of a wall of a building and um, they said to me and I, so on my first day they, they came up to me at the end of the first day and they said oh um you slightly confirmed to us what uh, this is. This is this is a building, but it's not a dwelling. It's, it's very unusual uh, for this time. It's not a dwelling. It's a it's a workshop. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Um, that's interesting. Um, then the next day, I went back to the same spot and I carried on working. And um, I discovered some objects in the bottom of the slot trench, and some of those objects were glass beads. And and I was cleaning the glass beads and I suddenly thought, I've been here for less than 48 hours and I'm standing in a workshop cleaning glass. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this is my life. 
there's no escape. <laughs> there's no escape. Um, but what, what was interesting was that uh, two weeks after that, uh, a team of archaeological students came down from Trinity College in Dublin to look at the site. Uh, they were discussing these glass beads and... And they had some theories about them, and and I said to them, "Well, actually, I work with glass, and I know exactly how those were made. I saw them being made by kids in Cairo about a year beforehand. Uh, it's like a, it's like a little technique that you can to produce it. And then I realised that uh, I was informing them, and they were very interested by this, and I was informing them about how something was being made in the archaeological in in, in their archaeological studies. And I thought." Oh, that's right. I've got something to contribute that's not in the glass world, but it's actually in the narcological world. And, and then, like, that was when the light, that's the sort of light bulb moment when you realize I've got something to contribute outside my normal practice. And that was the start of that. Fantastic. That's, that's so exciting. And I think it is, it's also that thing of, when we step out of the, our own immediate world where we, we, we are, F familiar with so many of the elements we recontextualize or, or we can get a sort of a, a fresh perspective on our skills and experience and what they what value they may have outside of the world that we we normally habitually inhabit that's yeah absolutely yeah, yeah that's exactly exactly right that's exactly right um okay matt i i know we're getting uh coming up on time i was wondering if you had time for a few quick questions sure just to finish up Okay, so the first one is, uh, what do you do when you get stuck? And I'm asking this partly because I feel like the stakes are even higher for you when you're working on a collaboration. Uh, so if you are pursuing an idea and things aren't working, how do you manage your, your, your frustration or sense of pressure for time? Just do you have a process for dealing with, with a dead end? Um, well, the, 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 tr the slight thing about our glass is that you, you have to be quite pre-planned with it because it's, it's a series of processes uh, to get to that point. But um, if if I un understand the question right, if it's like a writer's block, um, I tend to refer back to um, to sketchbooks. I've, I've always done them. Particularly, it's great to do them when I'm travelling um, because it's a time when I'm sitting down and I can just jot just, just out ideas. So... I, I refer back to the sketchbooks. I know that's kind of a bit old school, but actually, I find it. I I love doing visual diaries. I've done I've got I've done a diary. I've done a kind of visual diary of every trip I've ever made, and and found objects that I stick in there and photographs. And it's just a physical thing that I can hold and I can colour in and and I can jot down ideas. So I I refer back to sketchbooks. I'm not sure if I sent you the question, but um, how how would you define creativity? You did send me that question. Um, how do I define creativity? Oh, you know, I just, I just, I, I guess I just feel that in a sense, creativity is all around us. And I think that even if it's like cooking or, 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 um, you know, uh, arranging, arranging your bedroom, I just, I just find, I find that it's so in sync in, in me, what I do, that I, I just, I see creativity all around me and I just, I love the process. In fact, I love the process sometimes more than than, than the end, end product. So, um, yeah, I find it all all embracing, and uh, I I love that. I love that. I love seeing other people's creativity. Uh, I I I I think I think creativity to solve all the problems in the world. That's that's my that's my view on it. And do you think anyone can be creative or is creative? I think I think. I think when I, I have two young children and I think that, uh, that kids can show that anyone can be creative. And I just think that we get told that we're not creative. We get told we're not good at drawing or we're not, we don't have good ideas, that there's only one, one way of doing something. And I think pretty soon we get drummed out of us that we're not creative. I think that uh, we can all respond, respond to things in a creative way. Um, and, um, and I just think that it's so easy for people to be told, oh, you're not a good drawer. Oh, it's a shame that you can't do that. You can't, and and I I I, I see more and more uh, that um, that uh, I think if you look at what people do you know, on the internet, they're being they're being creative without even realising they're being creative. That would be my answer to that. <laughs> okay, and 
Yeah. So the last question is, do you have a creative challenge for listeners? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, and um, it was something that I did once in the studio. Um, so, so you have to be a bit prepared. Um, so you need a, a pen and or pencil and a piece of paper. And you need you need somebody to 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 have an object, a small object, and that object you need to put into your non-drawing side side. So if you're right-handed, on your left-hand pocket, they place the object into your pocket. So you don't see the object. You don't see what that object is. And then what you do is you, you put your non-drawing hand into your pocket and touch the object. And then with your drawing hand, draw, draw what you feel. Now, what happens is, uh, inevitably, is people draw what they imagine is in their pocket rather than drawing what they, they're touching. A great skill to have is to draw from what you touch because you'll, you'll feel the material, you'll feel the weight, you'll feel the texture and the form, and then you translate it into the drawing. Um, and we did this as an exercise. So what I did was I did a, I put a ball, a round ball, a small round ball on, on a cone shape and stuck them together and put them into the non-drawing hand side uh, uh, of the students and got them to draw, draw what that object was. And it was amazing how many people drew an ice cream. An ice cream cone. When we, pre- when we, when we uh, analyzed what they had done, I said, well, that's impossible. Nobody can sit, stand there with an ice cream in their pocket. <laughs> so that was, that was, that was, that was, uh, that was, that was the premise of it. So it, because we're very used to drawing things from our imagination, but we're not used to drawing from what we visually see, but we're not used to drawing things that we can't see. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. It's very interesting to, when you do that, you see what the results are. Um, it's about interpreting something um, through touch rather than through the visual. Absolutely. And, and being really honest with, yeah, just how honest are you being with what you're drawing? How, how truthful to, to the, the experience? And that's really exciting. Yeah, it's a good challenge. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, it would be great to see what people come up with. Okay, Matt. That is it. That is us done. So just thank you. This has been a, a, an absolutely delightful conversation and really inspiring because of you, your approach and enthusiasm for, for what you do, but also the, the path that you've taken. And you've, you've just, uh, well, exposed to me certainly a different way of thinking about where one's career could go when, uh, when working with a material. And that's, that's just really inspiring. And, and uh, I want to thank you for, for sharing that. And um, and thank you for taking the time to to have a chat with me. That's a, no, that's not, not at all. It's a pleasure. Really good questions. Give, gave you lots to think about, and um, and and I hope enjoyed the challenge. Thank you, thank you again so much. Great. Okay. Bye. Have a good day. All right. Thanks. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Hey there. Thanks for taking the time to listen to this episode of the Practical Creative. If you'd like to learn more about Matt and his work, you can visit the Practical Creative website at thepracticalcreative.life, where you'll find images of his work and links to other material. And if you'd like to have a go at Matt's Creative Challenge, you can find a written version on the Creative Challenge page. Just head on over to the website and check it out. And if you've enjoyed this episode of the Practical Creative Podcast, it would be great if you would subscribe to the show, leave a review, or follow me on Instagram at Practical Creative. Also, just really quickly, if you're interested in ceramics or makers with an uncompromising approach to their work, then check out my Q&A with Gareth Mason. Gareth is a ceramicist working with a highly distinctive and powerful visual language that challenges the limits of both the clay and the audience in equal measure. You can find it over on the Practical Creative website. Mm-hmm.